Okay, welcome back class <clears throat> to our continuing uh, lecture series in macroeconomics. Um, <clears throat> again, we're just going to touch briefly on uh, we were talking about um, you know tax implications. Uh, obviously, when we go into government meddling in the market, well, <clears throat> taxing uh, does uh, come to mind. So, just uh, <clears throat> briefly, as we saw. Um, you know, who pays, the, who bears the burden of the tax? And that's why, again, elasticity is so important. I hope everybody's uh, working on their uh, second discussion question. Um, it is a little involved, but I'm sure you'll do a good job. Everybody's been doing actually a pretty fine job so far. So, so far, so good. Uh, <clears throat> this, this will be, um, we'll be cleaning up uh, the chapters, and then the next lecture, uh, well, there'll be probably two parts to this lecture, but the next one will be a review lecture for the first exam, okay? The first exam will have about eight uh, essay questions, and, you know, you'll have plenty of time to take the exam, and we'll have multiple days, so it, it, if you can't do it on one day, you can do it on another. Um, but take your time with it. But no, once you've started the exam, the clock is running and um, you'll have a certain amount of time to finish. Typically, I give two to two and a half hours. I'll even extend it uh, out to three hours for you folks. And hopefully, uh, I'm sure that'll be plenty of time. All right. So, <clears throat> again, what we said, the more uh, vertical whether it's the supply or demand curve is, the more inelastic, the more horizontal, meaning it's moving left or right, obviously the more response, the more elastic. The rule of thumb is <clears throat> whether it's the supply or demand, or whoever has the more inelastic curve will bear more of the uh, tax incidence, the tax burden. Now, then we go to the question, well, how much is, is, is too much or how much is not enough? Here we have this, um, and again, you see these black uh, wedges, all right? That, that represents dead weight loss. Nobody gets that, all right? And that's the uh, situation uh, that we encounter when we look at some of these uh, price controls that the government imposes. Uh, it creates dead weight loss, and nobody gets it. All right, here in the, uh, a small tax, it's not really enough to generate much income. And as we know, <clears throat> markets are typically efficient, and they do typically move towards equilibrium, which we're going to be talking about uh, a little later today. Um, however, the markets can fail. <clears throat> Classic example, again, is pollution or monopoly controlling of a price and raising it. Uh, on a product that is uh, essential or needed and then the government needs to step in, which we're going to be looking at uh, on, the, on the next whiteboard. We're going to um, have a recap of, of basic markets. Um, anyway, we're looking at, at this one here, and we know that, say, hey, the government needs some funding. Government <clears throat> has to generate income to correct for market failures, or to, in general, uh, supply the things that aren't well provided for by the private sector, right? In this case, <clears throat> tax isn't large enough. In this case, you can see by the rather large uh, dead weight loss wedge, the tax is too big. You, know, you don't want the tax so large that it squashes or crushes the industry that you're taxing, okay? so. Same way as with uh, income tax. In the, at one point in our history, the income tax was so high, you know, people were just you know, not working. And that is uh, also reflective of the uh, Laffer curve, which we'll get to in a minute. So here, the government's taxing too much. It's actually uh, crushing the industry that it's taxing, and you don't want that. This is that happy medium where, you know, it, it's, it's taxing, you know, there is a tax burden that has to be borne by some 
by the supplier or the demander or both if they share in the elasticity uh, their elasticities are the same meaning supply and demand elasticities are the same then they will share equally in the tax and I think that's part of your <clears throat> discussion question and I'll give you a little heads up uh, again with a totally inelastic good or service there isn't any dead weight loss so um, that's the ones that the governments absolutely love to go after these um, these all have dead weight loss now Laffer Arthur Laffer came up with a, 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 an idea still being debated but it, it somewhat makes sense that the, uh, actually a total revenue and, and the tax um, looks somewhat like this now what he's saying is as the tax rate goes up, this is the y-axis is the tax rate, x-axis is total government revenue. As the tax rate goes up, total government revenue is, is increasing, okay? However, there is a point, and it would be somewhere around here, that if they keep raising the taxes, folks are just not going to produce the industry won't produce, people in general won't produce, okay? It's, um, <clears throat> they'll actually cut back. And again, it's, uh, when we look at um, a supply curve, if, if we are talking about the supply of labor, you and I, you know, typically the supply curve curves upward, meaning as the wage rate increases, we are more than likely to offer more and more of our leisure time, trade our leisure time, for work time. However, if the, the wage gets to a certain point that we're, you know, we, we aren't seeing our family, our friends, and the wage has gone up so high that actually increasing the wage even further might have us cut back on our amount of supply of uh, working hours that we're willing to offer. In a similar, somewhat similar idea, that what, what Laffer is saying is that if the tax rate keeps going up and up, at some point, industry people are going to be cutting back because it's just not worth it, okay? That happened in the uh, early 1960s. The, um, the marginal tax rates were extremely high. John F. Kennedy slashed those in the early 1960s, um, which quite frankly averted what could have been a... Uh, a fairly nasty recession okay so at any rate this is what we're looking at and now uh, again we should probably include uh, taxing as probably um, government intervention into the market but when we think of government meddling with the market typically we think of uh, the big three which are price ceilings price floors and quotas okay these two are price controls. This is our quantity control, okay? All right, but before we get into these big three, let's briefly recap, you know, what, what the market is, what, what the different market structures are, okay? And I, and I think it will be good for you to re remember these, uh, even though somewhat more of a, uh, what you would call a microeconomic uh, idea, as we said, you can't separate, you can't separate micro and macro economics because everything we are looking at right now in macro, it, you know, the ideas and the concepts are, you know, are coming from microeconomics. Now with macro, again, we've expanded it to the entire economy. All right, <clears throat> so let's just take a real quick peek at, you know, what kind of markets are there? Well, the one that comes to mind that I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with is what they call perfect competition. Now, perfect competition is when we have a huge, and I mean a huge number of producers and also typically and consumers of a particular item, all right? There, there's tens of thousands of folks producing this item, all right? 
since the number is so great, and the other criteria is that the product is viewed as basically the same whether you buy it from one producer or another, which uh, in economic terms we call a standardized product. For, for, uh, for instance, uh, a bushel of wheat is a bushel of wheat is a bushel of wheat. If you go to a large um, uh, farm's market, farmer's market or something, <clears throat> naturally everyone feels that their wheat or their bushels of apples or whatever are the best. But <clears throat> objectively speaking, when you're walking by and you're seeing one bushel of wheat and another bushel, pretty much all a bushel of wheat, you know. So it's a standardized product. <clears throat> this number, huge, huge, huge number of folks making the product and a standardized product gives uh, rise to uh, the fact that no one has any market power. Market power, again, means the ability to affect the price. And typically in a, in a perfect competition, um, uh, there's a, a tremendous number of consumers. We think of um, the, uh, <clears throat> all the, uh, the producers that, that are producing wheat for uh, Kroger bread. And, it's, and Kroger bread, I guess, is what? Going for a dollar and a quarter a loaf. Well, no one can affect the price. So we say that they are price takers. They take the price that the market gives them, all right? They, they, can, they have no power to affect the price. Now, when we were looking at uh, producer uh, surplus and consumer surplus, we were saying, okay, well, you know, sometimes we'll buy something and we would have been willing to spend more, but we didn't have to because the market had established a price. And conversely, producer surplus, you know, you might have been willing to sell the item for less, but you didn't have to because the market had established a price. Well, here in, in perfect competition, Yes, the market has established a price, and typically what that demand curve looks like in a perfect competition is, is a perfectly horizontal line. It's the, the price is given, all right? You can produce as much as you want as long as it's at the market price. So if, you're make, if we're making wheat, you know, we, if it's selling for uh, $12 a, a bushel, Fine, you can sell, sell it as much as you want, but if you try to raise it to a dollar or twelve dollars and twenty-five cents, you're going to lose all your business. Okay, so we are all price takers. Same way as if you and I go to Kroger, and we're going to buy a, a loaf of uh, Kroger bread for a dollar and a quarter. Well, if we tell the manager we uh, we we feel this is unfair. It's, it's a dollar and a quarter is ridiculous. We, uh, we demand it to be lower to a dollar. Nothing's going to happen because we have no market power. We are all, as consumers, we are price takers. We take the price as given. Okay? And lastly, we talk about uh, easy entry and exit into the business. So, for instance, let's say um, one of you wanted to... Uh, Grow wheat. You have, let's say, you have a, a, a big backyard, and this coming summer you decide you're going to grow wheat. Well, how hard is it for you to get into that industry? Typically, not hard. What you need to do is you rent a tractor, okay, and you buy a, a, a bag of uh, of seed, and you you you, you seed the the ground, you you take care of it, and then in the fall you harvest the wheat, okay. You know, you're in, you're in the wheat business. It was fairly easy for you to get into the business. And you do this for a couple of years, okay? Well, after two or three years, you decide, you know, this summer, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do something else. Well, all you do is you don't rent the tractor and you don't buy the bags of seed. So it was fairly easy for you to get out of the business. In other words, exit the industry. That's not always true with some of these other forms of uh, market competition. Uh, sometimes uh, it involves a tremendous outlay uh, of money in terms of capital equipment, goods, machinery, uh, custom-made items, and uh, you have to think long and hard 
before you're going to uh, decide on whether I'm going to exit the business. Okay. Um, so then we have we have our perfect competition. Now in the next two we have oddly enough, called imperfect competition, okay? And the last is uh, what we would call practically no competition or monopoly. But the two imperfect competitions, the one is uh, called monopolistic competition. It's a little bit of monopoly and it's a little bit of perfect competition. In monopolistic competition, we have a large number of producers, not, not a huge staggering number as we did with perfect competition, but we have a, a, a large number, okay? Um, things like perfume manufacturers, uh, chocolate makers. Uh, they reference in one book, uh, economic books, which are uh, probably not that many uh, publishers of economic books. But anyway, uh, it, it would be a market that has a, a large number of producers, all right? Um, Classic example is uh, the food court, the fast food industry. You go to a, a shopping mall and there's, there's a pizza place, a burger place, or an Asian food or a Thai food place or a Mexican uh, restaurant. Uh, you have all these different uh, types of food. Now, you've got number one, you've got a large number of producers, okay? But, and here's the key, their products are, are, are similar. You know, underlying the fact that a food court, you know, whether it's a pizza or a cheeseburger, I mean, the bottom line is it's food, all right? But they, there, is a differ, there is a difference, okay? That difference gives the monopolistic competitors a little wiggle room to, to play with the prices, okay? And, and they do. So do they have market power? Yes, they have some within certain parameters. So, for instance, if you went to a food court and you're in the mood for a cheeseburger, and the cheeseburgers were always uh, $5, and if the price went up to $5.10, you probably would still get it. However, if you went there and the price was no longer 5 it was $7, then you would, uh, you probably would think twice and say, well, maybe that, uh, that Mexican uh, burrito sounds pretty good. I may switch. So they have some market power within certain um, boundaries, okay? And they do try to differentiate the, uh, the product. They are, the products are different, but underlying it, when it's all said and done, it is, you know, basically it's, it's food. Same thing with perfume. And I know a lot of, I know my daughters would probably disagree. They say, no, no, there, there's vast differences. Well, and then that's probably true, but... You know, after it's all said and done, the bottom line is it's, it's still perfume, okay? Now, here's one that's, it, it, that's kind of a toughie that you need to think about. They, they claim easy entry and exit into the industry. They do that because they're always saying that when there's, you know, companies entering or exiting, the demand and the marginal revenue curve will shift back and forth. Well, you know, depending on if, you know, producers are coming or leaving, which will affect whether or not they are, they are making money or just breaking even or if they're, if they're losing money, okay? Now, with monopolistic competition, uh, again, it's a tough one because if you think going, uh, and again, even in a, a fast food industry, you don't have to be nationwide, even if you're compete, competing regionally. Let's say you're, you're, you're trying to compete uh, in the fast food market, hamburgers, just in the Detroit metro area. Well, even with that, you're going to open 25 or 30 stores. I mean, that's a pretty big outlay. And when you start you know, putting the booths in and all the, uh, uh, the washers and all the other equipment in the back, in. A lot of that is custom made. You're not going to get your money out as you would if you were, let's say, a manufacturing company and you bought, a, you know, five machining centers. Well, these machining centers can be can be used by a lot of industries. So 
you'll be able to sell those if, if you want to exit the industry. It, it would be a lot harder to exit uh, that kind of the, the fast food industry, even on a regional basis. Now, if we go all the way down to, you take out a little grill, you got a stack of frozen hamburgers you got from Kroger's, and you grill them up and you're on your street corner, and you know, you, you sell them, okay, was that easy entry? Yes, and you, you, you sold all the stack of uh, hamburgers, and now you're all set, and you think, oh, that's it, I'm, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Was it easy exit? Yes, it's easy exit. So in that respect, in that case, there's easy exit and uh, entry into the industry. On the larger scale, I'm not so sure, but they say that because in general, if companies enter or exit the, um, the industry, it's going to shift the demand and marginal revenue curves and either if there's, for instance, if um, the business had not been profitable, it was too difficult, and you're not really even breaking even economically, companies are going to exit. Then the ones that remain, the demand and marginal revenue curve will shift to where they will probably at least be breaking even economically. Also, on the other end, if, if um, companies are making more than breaking even economically, they're making a, a nice, nice profit, you're going to have companies entering that field. And again, the demand and marginal revenue curve will shift to adjust, to bring it back towards um, long run uh, economic break even point, okay? And that's another thing. Um, in the long run, the, the, due to this shifting back and forth, eventually they say, well, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna arrive at um, a break even. That, that also um, is, need, needs some thought and is up for debate. Um, anyway, um, we'll, we'll stop right there because we, we could continue this debate and argument for quite a while, but those are the basics of monopolistic competition. Oligopoly is, is somewhat similar. However, instead of a large number, there's only a handful. Greatest example was the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, and uh, used to be the little sister, uh, American Motors, okay? For years and years, they had pretty much in the 50s and the 60s, they had pretty much control of the market, okay? However, their industry, their, their portion of the market was marked by interdependence. One is, inter they're always looking at what the other one is doing. They want to see, you know, what are they doing price-wise? Are they lowering? Are they raising? What are they doing with their price? The product itself is very, very similar, okay? Uh, and they try to differentiate it with advertising so making a Ford 1F, uh, Ford 1F, uh, 150, F-150 truck, uh, you know, uh, an item that is nothing near what a Ram Tough truck is, okay? And my son-in-law, for instance, loves his F-150, and he would say, oh, it's nothing like the Ram Tough truck. Uh, that's, that's good advertising. You try to differentiate your product. The more you can differentiate, the more wiggle room, the more market power you will have. So oligopoly, do they have um, market power? Yes, they have some. Again, within certain parameters, okay? Now, uh, and again, the more you can differentiate your product, the, the more you know, wiggle room you will have, okay? Typically what happens in, in an oligopoly, if we have a price leader, if the price if the price leader decides to raise their price, and I'm talking about not within that little narrow range, but I mean beyond that range, um, again, saying, for instance, if the um, F-150, if Ford could play around, let's say, $100 or less, either way, it, would, you know, it wouldn't affect uh, their market. But if they went and they raised their price $300, what would the other folks do? Well. They would 
sit back and watch and see, is that price increase going to uh, take effect? I mean, will the, will the public, you know, uh, buy it, you know, and, and see? And if they do, then they'll follow suit. However, if Ford lowers their price, again, beyond that, that comfort zone <clears throat> quite a bit, the others, and this is the uh, going back to the interdependence, the others will probably not wait. They will probably also lower their price uh, because they don't want to lose market share, okay? And while we're um, talking about price, there's different types of um, pricing and typically price fixing is illegal in this country. If you do it out in the open, it's called overt. If you do it behind closed doors, it's called covert. Or if just the nature of the industry, uh, it happens that, yeah, the prices seem to, to move that way, they call it tacit or uh, price fixing. In this country, price fixing is illegal. However, the greatest example of an overt price fixing uh, oligopoly would be OPEC, okay? All right, so some market power within boundaries and, and this is a, 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 the differential between monopolistic and oligopoly, very large barriers to entry and to exit, okay? Because if you're, if you're, let's say you're going in the automotive business, I mean, even look, look at, at uh, Elon Musk uh, with the Tesla. Um, did, did he have to overcome barriers? Absolutely. They, they lost a billion dollars, you know, trying to crack into that market. I mean, it takes a, a lot of guts and a lot of fortitude to be able to get over that barrier. So oligopoly typically high barriers to entry, and if you are trying to exit, you know, you're looking at an awful lot of equipment that, yeah, you can, you can sell it, but you're, you're still gonna take quite a big hit. So there's, uh, there's a lot of thought going in before you exit the industry as well, okay? Last one, and then we will move on to the meddling, is monopoly, um, or monopsony. Monopoly is one supplier, one maker of a particular good. Monopsony is one, one uh, buyer, meaning monopsony would be uh, that one, uh, the, the company town in West Virginia, where they buy up, they're the only buyer, they buy up all the labor, okay? Monopoly is one supplier, and the most basic way, most generic way I can put it is, what does a monopoly do? What they do is they restrict the quantity to drive up the price, all right? Society in general wants more of their product. They don't allow that quantity to hit the, the market, and what happens, it drives the price up, okay? Typically, there'll be a monopoly can be, uh, if you have a uh, uh, control of a scarce resource, for instance, uh, De Beers in the diamond uh, industry, controlling the diamond market, or uh, if you've got a technological superiority in a particular product, which you have to be careful of because just like the folks who had um, eight track tapes, uh, all of a sudden they had a monopoly on that, but what happened? And they had cassettes. Then they had CDs, and they went on and on. So uh, technology is, is great, but sometimes it can be short-lived. There are government-granted monopolies, patents, and, and copyrights, things of that nature, okay? Government generally tries, would like to prevent them, if at all possible. If it can't prevent them, it tries to regulate them, right? And then there are what was called natural monopolies. A uh, good example would be, um, <clears throat> you know, your, your, electric, your electric company, your utility company. Let's take it, we have a, a medium to small town in the southwest. It really, it doesn't need two electric companies, okay? It doesn't need two gas companies. 
there's just not a need for it. So having one company be the monopoly supplier, it's, it's what is known as a, a natural monopoly. Those are the ones the government will try to regulate, okay? All right, <clears throat> do they have market power? Yes, now, <clears throat> they have huge market power. But here's the thing, they still have to remember that if, if, they, if they take this too far and they try to drive the price up so high that it crashes beyond the demand curve, in other words, the price of diamonds, they raise the price of diamonds so high, people are just going to say, well, the heck with it. We're going to, uh, we're going to buy sapphires or emeralds or rubies or something else, all right? So, Monopoly market power, huge market power. Absolute and totally unlimited market power, no, because eventually some the consumers are going to say, wait, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do it with something else. We'll make something else work for us, all right? All right, so that's um, the basic four uh, <coughs> market uh, structures. And now we'll get into our first one. Let's see how, what the time is. I don't want to make this one too long. Um, okay, we're we're good right now. I again, I'm trying to keep these on a shorter side so that I can load them a little better. All right. And this is government intervening in the market. Okay, I hope we can see that all right. Okay. Now, government intervention in the market. Well, remember, the market generally is efficient, okay? And it does generally move towards equilibrium, as we talked about uh, in the early, uh, uh, earlier portion of the course. You know, we had a surplus or a shortage and market pressure would build, bringing us back down to equilibrium or back up to equilibrium, okay? And uh, we said that, you know, this, this usually works, okay? However, the market can fail, all right? And when that does, government intervention is, is needed. Okay, these are examples. We talk about the EpiPen, a national defense, and so on. So, the three again, three government actions, price ceilings, price floors, and quotas. Now, when we talk about the first one, price ceiling, these were always tough for me to get because I always think, when I thought of a ceiling, I always looked up. And you're thinking of a ceiling, you're thinking of a ceiling up there. And normally, yeah, that's true. That's where a ceiling would normally go. With a price ceiling, here we have, we have our demand and supply curve and our, our happy equilibrium point, right? Okay, remember equilibrium, that's where the quantity of demand is equal to the quantity of supply. Now, with this scenario, we're going to be we're using um, rent control as a, as a good example. Um, you may place, you can place a price ceiling anywhere you want on this on this grid on this graph okay however the important thing to remember is with a price ceiling for a price ceiling to mean anything the ceiling has to be exactly where you don't think a ceiling would be it has to be below the ceiling has to be below the equilibrium point okay um, if it's above it they call it non-binding means it doesn't really mean anything. Um, example would be, um, a real simple example would be Lion is selling pumpkins. It's, uh, it's fall, he's, got, he's in the pumpkin patch, and he's, boy, he's busier than heck, he's selling pumpkins, $5 a pumpkin, $5 a pumpkin, $5 a pumpkin. And, I, and he's happy, everybody's, you know, happy, they're getting their pumpkins. Now, a price ceiling if the government put a price ceiling above five dollars, let's say eight dollars, and would that do anything? Well, Langus would say, "Well, so what? It, it doesn't affect me. I'm 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 busier than heck. I'm selling all these pumpkins at five dollars. 
uh, you know, uh, an eight dollar saying the price can't go above eight dollars really is doesn't affect me. However, a price ceiling below equilibrium, below Linus's equilibrium of five dollars, if the government said you can't go above three dollars, then we have a situation. Then we have uh, something that's going to affect the market. Okay. Same thing with this. We're, we're looking at um, the uh, rent controls in, in New York City. And rent controls go, goes back to World War II. And, and again, a lot of these things, they, people meant well at the time. It's just that uh, in, in certain areas of New York, uh, we've got some building apartments that are still under these old rent control laws. So what happened in World War II, the government was afraid that the folks who owned a lot of the apartment buildings, especially around New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., you know, we had a lot, large segment of the population moving to these big cities uh, because of the war, and, and they, had, they had wartime uh, jobs in, in one, uh, one area or another. So they were concerned that with all these people moving, the landlords were really going to take advantage of this and uh, just raise the price like mad. So they instituted rent controls, okay? A, a pri and, and rent control is a great example of a price ceiling. Now remember, a price ceiling, to define, is the upper limit a price can go, okay? It cannot go above that price ceiling, all right? It wants to but it can't, all right? Um, just like before we were talking about a price, if it floated down below equilibrium, well, what would happen was the market would create pressure and bring it back up to equilibrium. In this case, it can't because the government mandated a price down here. And when the price ceiling, again, is below equilibrium, that's when we have a binding price ceiling. That's when it means something, okay? So, if we had, if this was our market for uh, apartments in New York, and I know the numbers are, are, are light, but let's just use these numbers uh, for our example. Let's say uh, in New York, the equilibrium price for an apartment was $1,500. And at $1,500, we had 3 million apartments being rented, all right? That was the equilibrium price and quantity, given our, our supply and demand curve. Government comes in and says, wait a minute, we're going to install a price ceiling at $800, which is way down here, way below equilibrium. You say, well, well what happens? Well, well, what happens is not unlike what we talked about before. We have the $800, we bring it across, and we see it hits the supply curve here, because the folks who own these buildings, they're not real thrilled about this really, really, really low price. So it hits the supply curve here, so we bring it down and say, oh, only two million apartments are being offered at that really low price. And let's keep going with it, and we bring it all the way over to the demand curve, but at that really low price, we've got four million apartments that are wanted, are demanded, folks want the, the Four million um, apartments. Okay, so what, what, what will, will happen? Well, as as we can see, we've got quite a shortage. We have four million wanted, but only two million being supplied. So we we have what we have. We've got a two million dollar hole right there. Okay, so we've got a shortage of two million apartments. What are the problems with the price ceiling? And then I'll, I'll we'll end it and then I'll start the, the, the next video. You'll need to remember these because I can guarantee this will be a, a big question. There are five basic problems with price ceilings, all right? Number one, it reduces the quantity below efficient levels, okay? So it reduces the, the efficient level was three million it reduces the quantity because that's all that's being offered. You know, so it's, that's it, folks. You know, it's not as if 
uh, we're going to get around it. So, you know, we've got only 2 million being offered. Well, if only 2 million are being offered, guess what? That's it. So here comes our, 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 black, our black wedge, okay? So, inefficiently low client, all right? Again, normally the uh, market would correct this, but in this case it can't because the government's mandated it, all right? Uh, does, it, does it work? It, it, it's a real toughie. I mean, look at Venezuela. We have a, a country that should be very, very rich. Um, and what's going on there? You've got a country with runaway inflation. Uh, government at, at first blush goes to the people and says, hey, look, we're going to give you really, really inexpensive food. And quite honestly, inexpensive food, you know, sounds like a good idea, especially, you know, for a lot of the poor folks in Venezuela. So, yeah, that sounds great. That's wonderful. Really cheap food really low-cost food. However, when the government then turns to the producers and says, all right, for the, uh, the wheat, for the market, uh, you know, uh, the market price was, we'll say it was $12. And the government says, you cannot charge more. You're, you can't go above $7. Well, let's say it costs them Eight fifty or nine dollars to produce the darn wheat. Are they are they gonna are they gonna produce? You know, let's say it costs them nine dollars to produce. They were selling it for twelve. Well, are they going to continue to produce? You know, and lose two dollars uh, a bushel? No. And that's exactly what happened. So what did they do? They said, well, the heck with uh, supplying wheat or or um, a product for human consumption. We'll grow something else that the government isn't controlling price-wise. We'll grow some kind of a hog feed that's not really fit for human consumption, but we can sell it and, and make money at it. And that's what they did. And so what happened was <clears throat> you've got, you know, empty bread shelves, you know, in the aisles in Venezuela because you know, they're, they're, they're producing way, way back here, all right? So then what happens? Well, if you're not making it domestically, guess what? You're going to import it, and they do. So, and you're thinking imported food's going to be cheaper than domestic? Uh, no. So they've got runaway inflation. In fact, I think I read the other day where in 2018, the this is almost astounding. You can't almost almost believe it, their inflation went, hit 80,000%. Um, anyway, that's, uh, we, we could spend more time on that. But and make a long, uh, long story short, just say it reduces uh, the quantity below the efficient uh, level, all right? What else does it do? Well, okay, there is a misallocation of goods. You and your family, you just got a job in New York, and it's a good job, you know, it's going to be a, you know, uh, you're, going to, you're going to be producing something, you're, you know, you're a productive member of society, and you, you try to move to New York, and you're looking all around, and you can't find a, a decent apartment to live in. Now, I know for a fact there are some extremely wealthy people in New York who are paying little, I won't say nothing, but they're paying very, very, very little for some four and five bedroom, really nice places, but they are rent controlled. Okay, I many, many, many years ago, I went to school with some, uh, and their parents own, and their parents had these rent control apartments. It was something that you would hand down generation after generation. All right, so you've got some really wealthy people paying hardly anything for some big apartments. Then you've got some families that really need it, that are, you know, came to work in New York, and they're going to be productive members of society. They can't find anything. They, they, I mean, they're looking at a studio, one-room apartment, okay? So in economic terms, we say, you know, it would be the folks that need it, deserve it, or should have gotten it, 
they're not getting it. The people who, who easily could afford to pay more, they're, they're getting the benefit of the rent control, okay? That, in economic terms, would be called a misallocation of goods, all right? Number three, wasted resources. Well, if you move to New York and you, how much time, energy, effort, money are you spending running around trying to find a place for you and your family to live? Okay? You'd be spending quite a bit, maybe a month, maybe two months, three months, right? So that's a lot of wasted resources, all right? Number four, inefficiently low quality. This is a kind of a, an interesting one. Now, if you own the building that's rent controlled, do you want those people to stay there? No, you want them, to, basically you want them to move out because once they move out, the rent control is lifted, you can charge you know, a regular amount for the apartment. So you are certainly not gonna keep the buildings in pristine shape. I mean, you may not have painted the darn thing for uh, eight, nine, 10 years. I mean, if someone calls because their hot water heater went out, you might say, oh, yeah, um, uh, our, our superintendent's not, uh, building super isn't around today. Uh, we'll get to it uh, as soon as possible. But, you know, it may, it may uh, take four or five days for you to, you know, get that fixed. You're going to do everything you can to, to hopefully get those folks to move out, all right? So typically, in, in, in this case, the, uh, the quality has gone downhill, all right? And it, it, again, it kind of just makes sense because you want the people to move out so they can get off of the rent control, all right? And the last one would be um, black market activity. That would be, you know, you're, you're enjoying a, um, a rent control place in New York and you're thinking, you know, I, I, you might want to try living in Florida for uh, a couple of years. Uh, especially with this uh, cold weather. So, you know, you, you, you find someone and you say, hey, look, I'll make a deal with you. You pay, uh, you know, if the rent control was 800, let's say, um, and, 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 you know, uh, 1500 would be, you know, reasonable. And you say to them, look, pay me, uh, pay me $1,200, okay? You're making, you'll be making out because you're going to be saving, you know, 300. And then you yourself, who's moving to Florida, you're going to be making money on the rent, okay? And, and then you go down to Florida for a couple of years. Maybe you stay or maybe you don't. But you're still going to be making out every month. Now, is this illegal? <laughs> yes, it's illegal. Does it happen all the time? Yes, it happens all the time. So illegal um, or black markets. And this will bring us to the uh, final um, topic on, on price ceilings of the price gouging laws. Basically, what, what it is, it's just that price uh, gouging laws are to address a, a temporary price ceiling, okay? For instance, think of, um, <clears throat> they had uh, the hurricanes down south. Folks, you know, <clears throat> without power, you know, a lot of them wanted generators, couldn't find a generator. <clears throat> some some uh, entrepreneurs thought, gee, you know, we could we could rent some trucks, go up north, buy a bunch of them for five or six hundred dollars, <clears throat> truck them down here. Even with the with the freight, we could sell these things for nine hundred dollars each. Now, price gouging laws are, are saying no. It's like a, a price, a temporary price ceiling. You can't go above it, all right? So what happens? Well, if the price gouge, if, if, if they are effective and, and they do stop this activity, you know, is it a good thing? Well, at first blush, you might say, yeah, that's a good thing. These, they, were, they were taking advantage of these uh, poor people down south. Well, you know, it's one of those yes and no type of questions because the uh, folks who would have been willing to spend the 900 they, you know, they know they're paying more, but they're willing, they're willing to pay the extra whatever it is, three, four hundred dollars, because they are, they are that concerned about whatever they have in their home 
that they are willing to spend the extra money, okay? So, uh, uh, it does, uh, the price gouging laws, uh, do, it does reduce the quantity that would have been available, okay? And it, it, it does kill economic incentives. Uh, you know, folks are going to say, gee whiz, we would have, you know, we would have gone, rented a couple of flatbeds, brought, brought a bunch of uh, generators down here. But price, the price gouging laws, you know, stop us. Price, it's a price ceiling, a temporary price ceiling. You can't go above the ceiling. It wants to, you know, here it wants to, but it can't because it's government mandated. Okay? All right, we will stop this and I'll start it with the next one because I want to keep these uh, rather brief, okay?